Today we continue to read from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, chapter first Adi Lila, chapter two, starting with text number thirty. Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada. O Lord of Lords, you are the seer of all creation. You are indeed everyone's dearest life. Are you not, therefore, my father, Narayana? Narayana refers to one whose abode is in the water born from Nara, and that Narayana is your plenary portion. All your plenary portions are transcendental. They are absolute and not creations of Maya. Please repeat. O Lord of Lords, you are the seer of all creation. You are indeed everyone's dearest life. Are you not therefore? My father, Narayan. Narayan refers to one whose abode is in the water born, of, born from Nara. And that Narayana is your plenary portion. All your plenary portions are transcendental. They are absolute and are not creations of Maya. Purport. This statement, which is from the Srimad Bhagavatam 10, 14, 14, was spoken by Lord Brahma in his prayers to Lord Krishna after the Lord defeated him by displaying his mystic powers. Brahma had tried to test Lord Krishna to see if he were really the supreme personality of Godhead, playing as a cowherd boy. Brahma stole all the other boys and their cows from the pasturing grounds, but when he returned to the pastures, he saw that all the boys and cows were still there, for Lord Krishna had created them all again. And when Brahma saw this mystic power of Lord Krishna, he admitted defeat and offered prayers to the Lord, <clears throat> addressing him as the proprietor and seer of everything in creation, and as the super soul, who is within each and every living entity and is dear to all. Lord Krishna is Narayana, the father of Brahma, because Lord Krishna's plenary expansion, Garbhodakshaya Vishnu, after placing himself on the Garba ocean, created Brahma from his own body, Mahavishnu, on the casual ocean. And, and Kshirodakshai Vishnu, the super soul in everyone's heart, are also transcendental expansions of the supreme truth. Om Ajnana Timiranda Syaganang Jana Shalakaya Rakshurum Militam Hinatasma Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manavu Vishnam Stapitam Jena Bhutale Swayam Rupakada Mahyam Dadati Svabharantatam Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Namade Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Vishesha Shunivati Pastyata Deshatarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Siyadvaita Garadha Shivashari Gauda Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare <coughs> So these prayers of Lord Brahma, which is being this second chapter of the Adi Lila is explaining the uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita is very scientific, especially in the beginning. In the beginning, uh, Krishna, Sri Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, he mentioned six subject matters which will be covered in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, Gurun, the spiritual master and the spiritual masters, and the devotees, you know, Shivas, Thakur, his energy represents the devotee, and Gadadhar, 
the, these transcendental energies of the Lord, uh, Shakti Tattva, expansions of Shimati Radharani and the gopis, and then plenary incarnations. Uh, Advaita Charya represents uh, Mahavishnu, all the different Mahavishnu expand, all kinds of different uh, expansions, and then the incarnation of the Lord, Nityananda Prabhu, and the Lord Himself. So these six truths are five truths, meaning Krishna and how he manifests himself as his expansions, his incarnations, his transcendental internal energy, his marginal energy, and those who explain all this truth, Sri Guru. So this is, this is what he says I will be speaking about. Of course, principally, He's speaking about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Therefore, he says, Bandi Shri Krishna Chaitanya Nityananda Sahutido, that these two lords have arisen. Out of these truths, we will principally be speaking about these two lords. Ushbhavanto, who is just like the sun and the moon, arisen uh, on the horizon. Godadaye, Godadaye Pushbhavanto. Chitro Shando Tamo Nudao. That they have, they're so wonderful. And especially, not only are they wonderful to look at, but they're giving benedictions to all. They're actually, they're not only giving benedictions, they are the benediction and they're the only hope for humanity. And Tamo Nudao. And specifically, they have come to eliminate the ignorance of material life. Ignorance of material life means that we want to stay in this material world. Anyone who has any intelligence will not want to stay in this, want not, will want not, not want to stay one second in this material world. If we want to even try to enjoy this material world, that means we're very foolish. But, of course, that's the nature of the conditioned soul. Therefore, Chaitanya and Nityananda have come. And then he explains another verse, uh, which is the basis of this chapter. Uh, that verse. Yad Advaitam Brahmo 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 Pinishadi Tadapiyasya Tanubha. First he explains the uh, impersonal Brahman. This is the first manifestation of the Lord. Otherwise, as you're ascending in spiritual understanding, you may have this understanding. But then he says, then there is Paramatma. And after Paramatma, there are expansions of the Lord. So that's what he's beginning to explain now. Expansions of the Lord. And incarnations of the Lord. Of course, before he said that, I just wanted to read again this one beautiful verse. Uh, two introductory verses to this particular chapter because they're so nice. Sri Chaitanya Prabhum Bande Balopi Yara Nugrahat Tarin Nanamata Graha Vyapti Siddhanta Sagaram. I offer my obeisances to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu by whose mercy even an ignorant child can swim across the ocean of conclusive truth, which is full of crocodiles of various theories. So this is very interesting. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was, after he had taken sannyas, he, uh, he wanted to travel to Jagannath Puri. First he wanted to go to Vrindavan. He, he started on his way to Vrindavan, but there were many obstacles. And... He was also, he wanted to find Krishna after he took sannyas because Lord Chaitanya has an internal and an external reason for everything. So his internal reason for appearing was to taste the mellows of Srimati Radharani. And his external reason, of course, when we say external, uh, there's nothing external about Krishna, but meaning that one reason is very deep, 
confidential, internal, and the other one is external, meaning it's exposed to everyone, which means giving Krishna Prema Pradayate. To take Krishna Prem, which has never been distributed before, and distribute it wild, widely. No. Otherwise, Krishna Prem is always available. No, it's always there. It's there in the Bhagavatam. It's there. Uh, it was there before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But to distribute it wide, widely, without any previous qualification, that is the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, when he took sannyas, he had basically the same... He had some external reason. One external reason was that in order to give the mercy to everyone, there were certain people who were avoiding him. Scholars, uh, atheists, Pashandis. But because they were part of Vedic culture, they would all bow down to a sannyasi. So in order that they would not uh, offend the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and they would try to take him somewhat seriously, he took sannyas. That was his external reason. His internal reason was that he wanted to find Krishna. And he was showing that if you want to find Krishna, you have to give up every other, other endeavor. Now, we've spoken about this in the last few days. It doesn't mean that you give up your endeavors, but it means you give up endeavoring for sense gratification. You give up endeavoring for something separate from Krishna. And you learn, as, as Krishna himself states in Bhagavad Gita, the art of yoga. No, the art of yoga means learning how to do everything for Krishna and satisfy every desire that we may have by serving Krishna. And we have, just like Krishna said, well, the demigods pray to the Lord in the fifth canto of the Bhagavatam. And they say, my dear Lord, that anything, uh, I know that you want to satisfy everyone's desire, especially your devotees. But when a devotee has a desire that will again somehow or another cause them to, to go into the cycle of birth and death, into material life, then uh, what you do is you put your lotus feet on their head and uh, you give them your lotus feet, even though they don't want it. They're not asking for that. But you give it to them because you want them to actually... You, you know what's best for them. So that is the stage we're at, anartha nivritti. Anartha nivritti means we still have so many desires, but somehow or another we're trying to surrender to Krishna. But to make that surrender process work, we have to be willing to take Krishna's mercy as he distributes it. Be willing and anxious to get Krishna's mercy. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did that. And internally, he wanted to taste. He wanted to... to show that if you really want Krishna, then you'll be willing to give up uh, the attachments, unnecessary attachments. Uh, we discussed that yesterday also. What is a necessary attachment and what is an unnecessary attachment? A necessary attachment is something just like someone may have children. So necessarily you have to be attached to them, otherwise you won't take care of them. Uh, but that attachment has to be seen in terms of Krishna consciousness that this person is a servant of Krishna. And therefore, by caring for them, that will also be service to Krishna. But if I see them as a nicely composed lump of matter, you know, uh, as very, that came from my lump of matter, then that's not very transcendental. You know. So this is, uh, this is what Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, by taking sannyas, he had the most beautiful wife, yeah, goddess of fortune. He had learning, reputation. No, not really wealthy, but he had enough wealth to survive. He had everything. And he gave that up just to search for Krishna. So, uh, when he did, he, he was on his way to Jagannath Puri. And at one point, he had to cross this big swampy area with, across the river border between Orissa and Bengal, and it's a very swampy area. It's not like you just cross the river, but you have to go through all kinds of swamps, and, and then you have to travel on the river for some time at that time. And so it was very dangerous. There was a war going on, and there was all kinds of wild animals. And so uh, the Brahmana, 
um, his name. He was staying with one Brahmana, Ramachandra Khan. So Ramachandra Khan said, it's very dangerous, but I will help you. So he, I got an expert boatman to take Lord Chaitanya. And immediately when the boat left, he began to chant the holy name. And the, immediate, the, the boatman said, no, 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 don't. There's all kinds of dangerous people there, and there's dangerous animals and crocodiles, full of crocodiles. They'll come and get us if you're making all this noise. And Lord Chaitanya said, this noise is what will protect you. So by chanting the Mahamandras, it says here, there's, there is conclusive truth. No, param sat, satyam dimahi, as it says in the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam, that we are in search of this satyam param dimahi. This, we want to meditate on this absolute truth, but there are so many crocodiles, so many theories, so many speculation within the waters of the conclusive truth that can deviate us. And so we need the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to navigate those waters very carefully and not become deviated or consumed by these wild crocodiles of atheistic and uh, materialistic conclusions. So that was the introduction. There's another verse, but just not to extend, I won't read that other verse, which has some wonderful meanings also. So in this particular verse, Lord Brahmaji as Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport, as, you know, because Brahma, when he met Krishna, Krishna was this beautiful, transcendental person, bigger than him, you know, greater than him, effulgent. And, uh, but then, now he saw Krishna in Vrindavan as a little boy. So he was thinking, is this the same Krishna? Could this be the same Krishna? Just like Uddhava says that Swamartili Lao Pai Kam Swayogabayam Swayogabayam Balam that your pastimes in this particular incarnation are very special because they're very human like. Actually, humans are like Krishna like, but it seems to us that they're human-like. Uh, but actually, Krishna is just showing that he is the actual origin of everything. He is the Adi Ras. He is the Adi Purusha. And therefore, whatever we're doing, whatever we're experiencing, especially in this particular planet, where people are more fashioned like Krishna, uh, they all have, they have two arms, they have two legs, two arms. So there's some similarity there. So we think Krishna is like us, but actually we're like Krishna. So when he comes in this particular form as Krishna, when he comes as Varahadev, or when he comes as Nasinghadev, immediately there's awe and reverence. But in the form of Krishna, there's no awe and reverence. No, it's not, because Krishna doesn't want awe and reverence in that particular form. Actually, before he came, that was what he was contemplating that everyone has worshipped me for all these cycles with awe and reverence. Now I want to be worshipped uh, with sweetness. You know, the sweetness of Vrindavan. I want to show everyone what is my transcendental topmost abode. I want to invite them there. No one will, will achieve Vrindavan with awe and reverence. You cannot enter into Vrindavan with awe and reverence. Even the Devotees who are situated in Shantaras, like the cows and the peacocks, the trees in Vrindavan, you know, they are full of rasa. Just like in the Chaitanya Chaitamrita describes Sri Madhavendra Puri as a, a kapatoror, you know, as a desire tree. That's actually his position in the spiritual world. But in that desire tree, there are the fruits of dasya, sakya, uh, vatsalya, and madhurya rasa. Otherwise, every living entity has some tinge of higher rasas in Vrindavan. There is no sense of, even though the cows are, are, are relishing Krishna, they're not relishing Krishna with awe and reverence. They're relishing Krishna's sweetness. 
And therefore, uh, the deer and the cows will just love to lick Krishna's transcendental body and taste the sweetness. So this is Vrindavan. So Krishna wanted to display this Vrindavan. So he came as Krishna. Because only Krishna can display Vrindavan. Even when uh, Krishna appeared as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, Advaita Charya said that actually only Krishna can, can do what's needed at this point in time. You know, I am Mahavishnu, but I cannot do this. I cannot exhibit a degree of mercy and compassion that it would be necessary to convert the fallen conditioned souls in Kali Yuga. I can't do that. Only Krishna can do that. And so when Krishna came as Krishna 5,000 years ago, Lord Brahma, he saw Krishna playing. And at first he understood this as Krishna, but then his pastimes became so. You know, playing as a baby, eating dirt, you know, crying all the time, stealing butter, you know, and, and now playing leapfrog you know, in the meadows with his friends and taking a little box lunch. You know, and so Brahma was thinking, is this the same Krishna? Just like in the, in the Bhagavatam, it says, Tirtas uh, Padam, Shiva Vadin Chinu Tam Sharanyam, that even Brahma and Shiva cannot understand the Supreme Personality of God. They cannot understand him. Very difficult to understand, even for Shiva and Brahma. And so Brahma is displaying that in this particular pastime. How can Krishna be a cowherd? the Supreme Personality of God. So, Brahmaji decided, I will, I will test him. No. no one can test Krishna. It's not our duty to test Krishna. It's du- Krishna's duty to test us. And actually, Krishna's not even testing us because he already knows. No. It's not that Krishna's giving us a test so he can figure out where we're at. Because he's in the heart. No. He knows exactly what we need what we're doing. No, but he, when he tests us, he wants to show us where we're at. He wants to show us what we're lacking in Krishna consciousness. Therefore, he puts us through these tests. And also his tests are made, designed in such a way to bring us to the point of surrendering. Uh, of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also gives tests. But first he gives the nectar of the holy name. He gives the nectar of Krishna Prem. Then, <clears throat> once we have the taste for that, then he says, if you really want this, now. You know, just like we see that uh, so, so many devotees, I see almost everybody I meet, uh, they ask the question at some point in time, in the beginning of Krishna consciousness, it was very easy, everything was very nectarian. But after some time, it's become a little more difficult. You know, it's become, you know, in the beginning, I was just chanting, everything was, was bliss. And now has become a little more difficult. Why is that? Because Lord Chaitanya, first he, g- he gave us the ne- nectar, just like sometimes I compare it to a credit card. You know, it's mercy. In a credit card, you just go out and buy, but then you have to pay the bill. You, know. you go out, you get everything, you buy it all, you know, but then, then the bill comes. So when the bill comes in Krishna consciousness, that's when Lord Chaitanya, that's when we take spiritual initiation, we take Brahman initiation, then we're actually, we're telling Krishna, now I want to go deeper. I want to surrender to you. No. First you gave me unlimited transcendental nectar with no cost. No. You simply gave me the holy name. You gave me the association of Vaishnavas, which is so valuable. No. You gave me Sri Guru. But now I have to understand what, what does it mean to have these things? How can I... How can I um, preserve them? How can I always have? Not that just I come to the temple and then I feel some ecstasy and then I go away. How can I feel that ecstasy 24 hours a day, which is recommended? How can I, when I chant the holy name, as Rupa Goswami says, that just, no jani janita kiyad bir amritai krishna varna tvai, that how will I taste Unlimited nectar, which is inconceivable, just by present, pronouncing these two syllables, Krishna. 
That's, no, I want that. I want that degree of nectar. Because Krishna is not cheap. So this, was what, this is why Brahmaji was, Krishna appears to be cheap. It's like uh, in the prayers to Lord Brahma, she, she the Prabhupada translates one prayer where, uh, where Lord Brahma says, Janata Manye, Janata Manaye, that people think, you know, they, they think they understand something about Krishna. So actually, Srila Prabhupada translates that he says, people are thinking, yes, I know Krishna, because that's what you experience in India. You, know, you go to India and say, yes, I know Krishna. Yes, I know very well. It's like one man we met on an airplane in South India. And so he saw us dressed like this. And he, he said, so uh, what, why are you dressed like this? So we said, uh, because we're devotees of Krishna. Oh, and uh, so we asked, yes, you, you, you know about Krishna. Oh, yes, I know everything about Krishna. And so then I asked, have you read Bhagavad Gita? No, no, but I know everything about Krishna. Never read Bhagavad Gita. So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is what we think. It seems very easy to understand Krishna, playing in the fields, you know, playing a flute. Uh, seems very easy, but no, to understand Krishna. Therefore, in this verse, he says that you are, you are sarvadehinam atma. You are the soul of every living entity. You are the soul of the soul. It's like the soul is the, uh, the force of the, uh, the spiritual force of the body. And paramatma is the spiritual force of the soul. And then he says, hmm. Adi, uh, Adi Isha, you are the supreme absolute truth, uh, Akila, Akila Loka Sakshi, the supreme witness of everything, the supreme controller of all the planets, of all the universes. So I was thinking you were just some simple cowherd boy. And that's what got me into trouble. In his first prayers, Lord Brahma, he says, now I see you standing before me with this beautiful transcendental form with a peacock feather in your head, with your dark bluish complexion, and holding a flute and a bugle, you know, and in one hand, uh, a morsel of food. When I first saw this, I thought you were a, a young cowherd boy. Now I understand that there is unlimited potency in this transcendental form. Within this form, this form cannot be understood. I thought I understood it. But then you demonstrated to me unlimited expansions of your transcendental form, all with unlimited energies. And when I saw that, I knew I made a mistake. So Brahmaji, he's saying, he says, Srila uh, Prabhupada puts in here, you are my father, because it says here, Narabhu Jhala, no? Narabhu Jhala Ayanat that you are Narayan, and I am your son, you know, because I was born from your expansion. I was born from Garbhodakshaya Vishnu. So I'm your son. So we're going to read a couple more verses because Krishna reveals something very special that's not even there in the Bhagavatam. Here, in, it's revealed by Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami. Shishu Vatsa Hari Brahma Kori Aparada Aparada Kshamhaite Magina Prasad. After Brahma had off offended Krishna by stealing his playmates and cows, he begged the Lord's pardon for his offensive act and prayed for the Lord's mercy. Tomara Nabhi Padma Hoite Ama Jan Mudhoi Tumi Pitta Mata Ami Tomaratanoi. I took birth from the lotus that grew from your navel. You are both my father and my mother, and I am your son. This is his justification. In the Bhagavatam, just the verse before this, uh, he says that. He says, I am your son. Just like when the son, if the son hits the father or the mother, or when the son is in, within the womb and he's kicking, that kicking is, is felt by the mother to be 
uh, love. You know? But if you kick someone, they don't take that as love. If you go up to somebody, <clears throat> you know, oh, I love you. you know, they won't, oh, yeah, that, oh, I noticed. You know? no. But it, when, when the baby is kicking or when the child is born and kicking his legs and mother's trying to change the diaper or whatever, you know, then she takes that as love. So he's saying the same thing. I may have kicked you. I may have offended you, but actually I'm your son. No. If a son does something wrong, then the father shouldn't take that as insubordination. It was just, you know, son making a mistake. So this is Brahma's plea. No. Pitamatta balakeri na loya parad, aparadakshama mori korana prasad. Parents never take seriously the, the offenses of their children. I therefore beg your pardon and ask for your benediction. But then Krishna answers. Krishna kahena brahma tomara pitta narayana ami gopa tumi kaiche amara nandana. Sri Krishna said, O oh Brahma, your father is Narayan, but I am a cowherd boy. How can you be my son? So here is Krishna's argument. How can a how can a uh, no young six seven year old cowherd boy have a have a a son? No. What what kind of a proposition is this? So therefore, he said here. No, she the probably translates in the verse. No, no, I know that this Narayan is your expansion. You can't fool me. Just like when Lord Chaitanya. No. when he went to the house of Advaita Acharya. So uh, he was taken to the house of Advaita Acharya. He was actually trying to go to Vrindavan, no. his first attempt to go to Vrindavan. And of course, Nityananda Prabhu, he didn't want him to go to Vrindavan. So, and he knew also it wasn't his time to go. So uh, but the Lord became lost. In, just to thinking about going to Vrindavan, he, be, he became lost in the thoughts of Vrindavan. And there were all these cowherd boys, and they was traveling through Radhadesh. All these cowherd boys were wandering around. He was thinking, I must be near Vrindavan. So Nityananda Prabhu, he told one cowherd boy, he said, if you see one sannyasi coming, and he asks you, where is Vrindavan? Uh, you just point him in this direction and say, here is the Yamuna. No, actually, it was the Ganga. So, so Lord Chaitanya came along totally absorbed in ecstasy and in internal consciousness. And he saw the cowherd boy and he says, he said, where is Vrindavan? Where is the Yamuna? I said, oh, the Yamuna is right over there. So he pointed him in that direction. And Chaitanya went running and he came to the Yamuna what he thought was the Yamuna. And he offered his obeisances and he offered prayers to the Yamuna. And then all of a sudden, Nityananda came up. He said, oh, Nityananda, you're here. I said, yes, yes, my Lord. Yes, I've accompanied you. And then, all of a sudden, he looks up and he sees Advaita Charya coming in a boat. No. And he says, Advaita, what are you doing here in Vrindavan? And Nityananda said, actually, we are not in Vrindavan. And Lord Chaitanya said, yes, this is very strange. Nityananda, you've tricked me. No, you told me this was the Yamuna. And, and, and Advaita Charya said, actually, my Lord, it is. Because you see, we're on the western bank. And on the western bank, when the Yamuna and the Ganga come together, then uh, the Yamuna is on, on the western side. So therefore, this is the Yamuna. So, no trick here. And, and Advaita Charya said, anyway, wherever you go, that is Rindav. So, please come to my house. So Lord Chaitanya went to his house. And, of course, he had just taken sannyas very, just a few days before. So he was very much in the mood of sannyasi. And so Advaita Charya invited him, and he said, so now you please sit down. Please sit down. And you take prasadam after they went through some, uh, you know, Advaita showed him how he was pre prepared everything nicely for the Lord and how he had fed the Lord. 
And then he sat down, sat Nityananda and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu down, he began to feed them. And so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, just give me a few little vegetables. He said, yes, I haven't, I haven't been able, I'm a poor man, I can't, I can't cook very much. So then he began to feed him in hundreds of preparations. And every time Lord Chaitanya would finish half, he would fill it up again. You know? And so Lord Chaitanya said, what are you doing? I can't take all this. You know, I'm a sannyasi. I'm just supposed to take a little bit. And he said, my Lord, please give up your, your antics. You know? Please give up your, I know who you are. You know? In Jagannath Puri, you take 54 offerings every day. You know? <laughs> so this is nothing for you. you know? so you just eat and stop this. You know? So Lord Chaitanya surrendered and began to eat. Of course, Nityananda said, I've been fasting for three days, and now there's nothing here. You know, even though there's hundreds of preparations. And, and Advaita Charya said, uh, actually, we don't even know who you are. You were just some avaduta wandering around. You know? I'm a caste Brahmin, you know? uh, and I am simply giving you what I, what I can give you, and you should be satisfied. And he said, is this what you do? You lure, lure sannyasis who have been fasting into your house, and then you don't feed them properly. You know? is, this what, is this the meaning of Brahman? So they began to argue. Like that. Finally, Dhananda got angry. And he took some rice and threw it on the ground. He said, this is, this, I, I'm still fasting. You know? I come here to, to stop fasting. He threw it on the ground, and some of the rice hit Advaita Acharya's body, and he began to dance in ecstasy. So the point is that, um, so Krishna is saying here, I'm a cowherd boy. But Brahmaji is saying, I know who you are. You are the source of, you are the original Narayan. You are that same person from whom I'm born. Don't try to trick me. Don't say that you're just a cowherd boy. And just thinking that you're a cowherd boy, um, that you can uh, trick me and fool me in so many different ways. Don't think you can do this. So <clears throat> then Brahma replied, Are you not Narayan? Certainly, you are certainly Narayan. Please listen as I state the proofs. And then he gives the first proof. Prakita, Prakita, Srishte, Yatta, Jiva, Rupa. All the living beings within the material and spiritual worlds are ultimately born of you, for you are the super soul of, of them all. So he's already said that in the verse. Now, he's, now Brahmaji, because Krishna is complaining, you know, Krishna is saying, no, actually, that's not me. So, uh, so he's saying here, yes, it is you. Because even though you are Krishna, I mean, this is what happened. First I thought you were a cowherd boy. Otherwise Krishna is bringing out this whole point. But wait a minute, you, you said I was a cowherd boy. So therefore, how can a cowherd boy have a son? Otherwise, you, you, what you did by stealing the cows and the cowherd boys was because you thought I was a cowherd boy. So therefore, I'm saying I'm a cowherd boy and I can't have a son. Therefore, I have no connection to you. Because actually, even though Brahmaji was asking for mercy, Krishna was, not, was saying, I'm not going to give you mercy. Because what you did is, for me, it's the worst thing anybody could ever do, what Brahmaji did. No. Uh, Krishna is actually saying this to him. Of course, at that point in time, in Krishna's Leela, Indra had not performed his pastime of you know, it seems like Indra, he was much more offensive because Indra attacked, you know, he attacked Vrindavan with thunderbolts and pieces of hail as big as elephants. You know, that's a pretty big piece of hail. You know, even a golf size, a golf ball size one can do us in. You know, every once in a while they have those, this, you know, here in this part of the country, golf ball size, baseball size. That can kill somebody. What to speak of an elephant size? You know, hail. So rain, you know, raindrops that were so big they, would just, they could practically flood. And it seems like it was very serious. All 
all Brahmaji did was take away some calves and cow herders. But Krishna didn't forgive him. And this is what's being illustrated here by Krishna saying, I'm a cow herder. Otherwise, I'm not forgiving you so easily. You just want to say, oh, I'm your son, and therefore, you know. No, because what Indra did caused all of Krishna's devotees to come together with Krishna. So Krishna actually, even though he chastised Indra for his pride, he actually appreciated the fact that he could actually go and lift the Govardhan hill. You know? uh, just the lifting of the Govardhan hill is so wonderful how Krishna did it. Nobody could understand. Krishna ran inside of Govardhan through a cave, right into the middle. And then he found this big cavern, you know, with jewels, all beautiful. Beautiful, of course, Govardhan is very special. And then he lifted Govardhan from there. And even though Krishna was a certain height, he lifted Govardhan about, uh, what was it, 20 some meters in the air. Oh no, more than that. Yeah, 30, let me see. I think it was 60 meters he lifted it in the air. Even though, you know, he didn't, just somehow or another he did that. And at the same time, he maintained his, his normal size. So only Krishna could do things like that. So, and all of the residents came in. He got all the residents of Vrindavan together. Of course, in the beginning, they were hesitant because they thought, you know, here's this huge hill and here's Krishna who's just a little boy holding it. And we don't even understand how he's holding it, but how long can he hold it? Even Mother Yashoda. The only reason Mother Yashoda came in is because she was concerned about Krishna. But she was also thinking, I'm very concerned about Krishna, but how, how can I get him out of here? Because if I grab him, then the whole hill will come down. You know? So she was very perplexed. Everybody was perplexed. Finally, Krishna got everybody inside. So, but Brahmaji took all of Krishna's devotees away from him. And actually, Krishna never forgave him. For all that time, he never forgave him until he came in the form of Lord Chaitanya. And Brahmaji came in the form of Haridas Thakur. And so he's called Brahma Haridas. And, and that, because he came as Haridas Thakur, he chanted unlimited uh, quantities of the holy name. And by that chanting, he finally got the mercy of Krishna. He had to wait 4,500 years you know, to get Krishna's full mercy. And you'll see if you read the pastime of, Brahma, of uh, Brahma's prayers, right after he finishes his prayers, he leaves. You know, he doesn't even wait for Krishna to... He feels so bad, he feels like his offense was so grave that he just leaves, offers his prayers and takes off right back to his abode. Because he knows, he can see... Krishna is not satisfied. And that's what's being displayed here. But Brahmaji, otherwise, even though his prayers are full of sincerity and begging for forgiveness, still, he's, he's, he's seeing Krishna. You know? He's ex explaining to Krishna here, yes, I did see you properly. So we'll just read this verse and then we'll stop here because you know, there's a lot of long purports after this, very philosophical one. And the cosmic manifestation is generated by the interaction of the three modes of material nature. The transcendental world has no such material modes, although it is nevertheless full of spiritual variegatedness. In the spiritual world, there are also innumerable living entities who are eternally liberated souls engaged in transcendental loving service to Lord Krishna. The conditioned souls who remain within the material cosmic creation are subjected to the threefold miseries and pangs of material nature. They exist in different species of life because they are eternally adverse, uh, averse to the transcendental loving devotion to the Supreme Lord. Sankarsana is the original source of all living entities because they are expansions of his marginal potency. Some of them are conditioned by material nature, whereas others are under the protection of the spiritual nature. The material nature is a conditional manifestation of spiritual nature. Just as smoke is a conditional stage of fire. Smoke is dependent on fire. But in a blazing fire, uh, there is no place for smoke. Smoke disturbs 
but fire serves. The serving spirit of the residents of the transcendental world is displayed in five varieties of relationships with the Supreme Lord, who is the central enjoyer. In the material world, everyone is a self-centered enjoyer of mundane happiness and distress. One considers himself the Lord of everything and tries to enjoy the illusory energy. But he is not successful because he is not independent, but he is a minute particle of energy of Lord Sankarsha. All living beings exist under the control of the Supreme Lord, who is therefore called Narayan. So here, Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami explained what Lord Brahma meant in this verse. That, that you are Narayan, you are, now I've realized you, you have expanded yourself unlimitedly, you are, you have exhibited your transcendental potency. I should have understood this before, but now I understand. So sometimes when Krishna uh, causes something to happen in our lives, we, we do the same thing. Then we become very prayerful, you know, and we become very repentant. So Srila Prabhupada said, we have to make sure that this repentance is not uh, smasana vairagya. You know. Smasana vairagya, the the lamentation or the renunciation at the cremation. Otherwise, when somebody dies, then we become a little serious, a little philosophical. You know, I've seen this, actually I've done several funerals uh, for, for you know, non-devotees. They asked me to do it. Some family members asked me to do the funeral because they figured I knew something about these things. I could see everybody, you know, I speak a little philosophy and everybody was asking questions, and but then, you know, a few weeks later, forget about it all. So this is called smasana bhairagya, that one becomes very, so here in Brahmaji, uh, he became very philosophical after his mistake. Sometimes we make a mistake or we, we uh, do something wrong in Krishna consciousness, then we become very repentant. You know. But then, the general tendency is, being conditioned souls, is that we give up that repentance. And we become, uh, uh, you know, then we just go back to our, our conditioned habits. So, because Brahmaji is in such a responsible post, Krishna is not going to, even though he offers most beautiful prayer, Krishna is not convinced that he has learned his lesson. Therefore, Krishna makes him come back as Brahma Haridas. Well, he doesn't make him, but he doesn't really fully accept his repentance. Of course, 4,500 years for Brahma, that's nothing. And for Brahma, 4,500 years, just a few seconds. So he didn't wait that long by his calculation. But it just shows that Krishna, otherwise, just like we're saying, the concept of Krishna is not cheap, and even less cheap, even more valuable, even more sacred, is the surrendering process to Krishna. And we can't surrender to Krishna by lip service. We can't just say some prayers and do some mudra and some mantra and it's all over, you know. Like sometimes I see, especially in India, if somebody steps on your toe or something, they just do a mudra. Let me cancel the offense. So th this is not satisfactory to Krishna. You just cancel the offense by some mechanical means or by offering some prayer or some mantra. But Krishna wants to see that we actually are repentant. And how do we show that we're repentant? We surrender more. Because this whole situation is created by Krishna. No. Everything that's happening around us, which is dictated by the... Uh, the law of karma, by our destiny, by our past activities. This is one prayer of Brahma, which was before this prayer. He says, my dear Lord, that actually a devotee should be very, very uh, content that with whatever mercy, whatever mercy, comes, however it comes, also, 
not whatever mercy. Not that we interpret what is mercy and what is not mercy. No. Because from Krishna, there is only mercy. No. The only thing that emanates from mercy. Even in the beginning of Lord Brahma's prayers, he says, this form that you show is, is simply a manifestation of your mercy upon your devotees to show this, this sweetness, this beauty, unparalleled beauty. No. This is your mercy. And also, then he says later on, what you're doing to me by chastising me, this is also your mercy. No. So a devotee has to see everything that's coming from Krishna. We, we like to have selective mercy. No. I like the mercy, pizza mercy, no. pizza prasad. No. I like that mercy. No. And I like this mercy. I don't like this kind of mercy, Krishna. No. I don't like this kind of mercy that creates difficulties in my plan or ruins my plans for material enjoyment. This type of difficulty, this mercy, I don't need this kind of mercy, Krishna. Thank you. But, uh, no. I just want mercy that comes in the form of material prosperity, material happiness. No. But this, is not, this may not be mercy. This may be Maya's mercy. Actually, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur he says that when a devotee is very serious, if they, if they actually become wealthy or they become, otherwise all of a sudden they get some material wealth, they become very suspicious. They become very wary. Is this really Krishna's mercy or is this my material desire? And I'm interpreting it as Krishna's mercy. But actually it's a material desire and it's something that will take me away from Krishna's service. So a devotee is very reluctant. Am I ready to properly, properly utilize this facility? Otherwise, what, in other words, he's saying, whatever Krishna gives us, we have to meditate. How will I use this properly in Krishna's service without having one ounce of the enjoying spirit in my consciousness? This is the meditation of a devotee. Therefore, having material things is such a great responsibility. It's like Maharaj was making the point yesterday in the class that uh, to have something, otherwise to, to have something in Krishna's service, to use something in Krishna's service, it's a meditation. That's why Grihastha life especially is a constant meditation. Just like a brahmachari sannyasi, they may be meditating on sankirtan, book distribution, preaching, serving the deity, and all. But a Grihastam's meditation can be even more complex because they have to take these material objects that they're constantly dealing with, the house, family, friends, society, and figure out how to use them. I have to meditate. How will I use this in Krishna's service? How will I not be affected by this? No. Just like the Brahmacharya or Sannyasti or Vanaprastha has to think, when I go out and distribute this book, how will I not be affected thinking that I am the doer? So the same type of meditation is there in Grihastha life. Not that a Grihastha, Adhikar, Adhikar means I have license. No? I, have, I can enjoy. But a serious Grihastha doesn't think that. Doesn't think that I have any more right to enjoy. That. This is Grihastha Ashra. I may be able to enjoy eating a little better. I may be able to enjoy certain material comforts. But my basic mentality is that all this is for Krishna's use. This is all Krishna's property. Therefore, just like Sudam Brahma, when Sudam Brahmana, when he returned from after meeting with Krishna, you know, he was, uh, he came back and he saw this big palace. And he saw this, his, this looked like the goddess of fortune coming down the steps. And he, he asked, who is she? I said, and one of the servants said, that's your wife. No. Oh, he had been totally transformed. And the only reason that, that Sudam wasn't transformed is because so that his wife could recognize him. No. Because if he would have been transformed, then later on his body was transformed into a beautiful form. No. But even though he got all that, immediately he went inside and he began to meditate on Krishna. And he, he just went to one corner of the palace and took rest on the floor, same as before. And, but Krishna gave him all of that opulence because Krishna was thinking, he's a little bit proud of his renunciation. So therefore, I take away his renunciation. No. 
But he's not, he wasn't thinking, oh, great, Krishna took away the renunciation, now I can enjoy. No. He still kept his renunciation within the opulence. You know? But he gave up the pride of being renounced. Now he had to accept, I have a beautiful body, a beautiful wife, big palace. You know? But le- now let me be careful that I'm not proud of my opulence and I'm not proud of my renunciation. You know? I'm simply trying to serve Krishna. So in that sense, Grihastha life is a challenge. It's not like, no, now I'm a grihasta, now I can enjoy like anything. No. I did, you know, did my stint, you know, Sankirtan. I did three years, five years, seven years. I did this. I did, was a pujari, surrendered to the deities. Now, you know, Krishna's given me this facility, now I can enjoy. Of course, inevitably, grihastas will enjoy a little more. Everybody likes to enjoy, you know. Actually, Sannyasis and brahmacharis have more access to Mahaprasadam, so they can enjoy more if they want to. But they have to be careful. Everybody has to be careful of what Krishna is offering us and to use it in his service. And then <clears throat> there's one verse in the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam. I can't remember it right now. But basically it says that uh, when Krishna's devotee wants to enjoy, Krishna understands. But the devotee always thinks, with regret, oh, I still want to enjoy this world. But a devotee doesn't become discouraged. A devotee happily executes their devotional service and feels some regret that I still have this enjoying spirit, but continues on and begs the Lord to please help me overcome this this weakness so that I can uh, simply serve you, be surrendered to you, and experience real happiness and bliss, which which can only come from your devotional service. So this is uh, what Brahmaji is trying to achieve. And he will achieve it when he comes in the form of Sri Haridas Thakur. But right now, he's still struggling to try to counteract his offense against the Supreme Personality of God. So I think I'll stop here. Are there any questions? Comment. You're talking about the tests that we get in trying to become devotees, and I think one one of them is how we how we react to get uh, when we're not treated right. Like I have a friend who lives a, a block from the temple. He hasn't been inside here for four years because he's waiting for a, a, an apology that's probably never going to come, mm. and there's a lot of cases like that. You know, people mm-hmm. say, oh, I didn't get treated right, so I can't go there anymore. So how do we overcome that test? Because we're not always going to be treated right. Well, there's two sides to that. Uh, one is that if we're, you know, we should understand why wasn't I treated right. That doesn't give somebody a right not to treat someone. You know, uh, Srila Prabhupada said, as someone comes to the temple, this may be the only opportunity in their life to, to approach Krishna, approach Krishna consciousness. So the devotees have to be very, very careful. I mean, even an ordinary salesperson is trained, even you know, weeks or months, that whatever, even the customer acts this way, that way, yells, screams, demands, you, know, you have to just smile and tolerate and just try to sell them the product. Make sure they come back. Even if they don't buy something, make sure they come back. Make sure they... So if that's an ordinary salesperson, what to speak of a Vaishnava? How surrendered a Vaishnava should be to uh, make sure that everyone gets the Krishna conscious experience in a very wonderful way. So, uh, but... The in, an individual, from our own point of view, we should think, actually that person treated me like that because I deserve it. You know, it wasn't very nice, I don't appreciate it. But who is the loser and who is the winner here? You know, if I don't come, you know, if I don't take advantage of Krishna's mercy because somebody said this, because somebody did that, I'm simply losing the opportunity to associate with the Vaishnavas, to be in kirtan, to take Krishna prasadam, you know, 
to see the transcendental form of the Lord who came only because, you know, that to help us, to give us his darshan. So how do we deal with that? We deal with that by accepting it as Krishna's mercy. And, of course, uh, we shouldn't just be trampled upon, so to speak. And one may mention, the person doesn't, uh, is not aware of the fact that they're treating others in, in an improper way, then we can mention it, you know, or mention it to someone else. That Actually, I haven't been here for a while because I was feeling very angry, I was feeling frustrated because this happened to me. But uh, we shouldn't deprive ourselves of Krishna consciousness. So there's two factors there. One is that devotees should be very careful that that doesn't happen. You know? Of course, sometimes our own, fault, out of false ego, uh, maybe we should have been treated like that. You know? It depends on the circumstance. Maybe I just uh, interpreted it wrongly. Maybe someone was actually trying to help me or to instruct me or to indicate something to me, and out of my own pride, I didn't want to accept it. So, uh, you have to, everything really depends on case by case basis. But I would recommend anyone who feels like that to come and take Krishna's mercy and to practice the art of forgiveness. And then the other person uh, has to practice the art of also forgiveness. You know, ask for forgiveness for my offense. Of course, to offend a Vaishnava is something very serious. If someone is actually offended, or we do something that offends someone, then we should take it very serious. So the key and the what should everybody should do is become a more sensitive Vaishnava. As we were discussing yesterday, the most important thing in Vaishnava culture is cultivating loving relationships. So this is the most important thing. More important, more important than administration, more important than, because that's what this temple is here for. That's what the Krishna consciousness movement is here for, to establish loving Vaishnava relationships, which will actually bring us back to Krishna's lotus feet. Only if we feel welcome in Krishna consciousness you know, will we actually, because there's so many obstacles by our own unlimited desires that we've accumulated birth after birth, those that in themselves keep us away from Krishna. So unless we feel loving uh, coercion you know, by being invited, by being prodded, by being you know, served, you know, when one is conditioned, one wants to be served. Just like when Srila Prabhupada began the movement, he was cooking, he was serving out, and everyone was saying, hey, let's go, let's go to Swamiji's and, and eat. You know? I mean, they weren't even thinking, let's hear some transcendental message. Yeah, the chanting is fun and, and the food's good. You know? So let's go. And finally, Prabhupada at one point had to say, well, wait a minute, I'm the guru and you're the disciple. You know? But first he just served them so that they could become attached to Krishna's service. Actually, when Srila Prabhupada was driving from, one time when he arrived at New Vrindavan, when he was driving from the airport, they offered him some prasadam in the car. And Srila Prabhupada said, yes, this is the process. This is my process. No. I simply gave them prasadam and, and chanting. I, I made no demand, no philosophy. Simply prasadam and chanting. Then when they were ready to inquire, then. Then you can say, okay, now I'm the guru, you're the disciple. Now you have to serve. Here's Krishna, you have to serve him. So if we actually have some position or some post in the temple or in, in any organization or namahata or bhakti riksha, or, or we're taking upon ourselves the some responsibility to, to help others come to Krishna consciousness, we have to have that degree of surrender and that, that level of compassion. That whatever it takes, I want to make these people feel welcome 
in Krishna consciousness. However long it takes. You know, if I have to feed them for 20 years, you know, 30 years, and before they surrender, then the service, it's an opportunity to please Krishna, to please another, to bring someone to Krishna's lotus feet. And so hopefully that all devotees can have that attitude. But if someone stays away for so long, I think there must be some pride. Yes. But how can you stay away from Krishna for four years? Or even four days? There has to be some pride there. That's right. <laughs> Actually, when Mani Griva and Nalakuvara, when they, once Krishna released them from the tree form, uh, they began to offer prayers. And one of those prayers, which is given in the Puranas, is that uh, before we were very proud, and so we had our head up and our chest out. But now we we pull our chest in and put our head down. That's a much better position. No. No. When we're very proud, we're like this. No. But, you know, when we're surrendered to Krishna and better, put my head down, chest in. Marines, they like this, chest out, head high. Of course, a devotee, because they're very proud of Krishna, just like Srila Prabhupada, he was, you know, because he was very powerful. He was giving Krishna consciousness, so he took that position. But internally, he was so humble. Anyway. Dealing with uh, new people or other friends who are cultivating. Uh, so I wanted to ask, like, uh, like when we are cultivating friends, we're giving prasadam to them and uh, encouraging them, uh, but they may not be, they're still not fully accepting the philosophy and they still have some mayavadi ideas like demigod worship and mm -hmm. so is there any line we can draw? Or like, it's like, well, or we should be keep on? Why should we draw a line? If they accept prasadam, if they accept a chant Hare Krishna, however long it takes, of course, one can be, you know, one has to try to administer Krishna's mercy in an intelligent way. If we see that here is someone who, if I have a plate of prasadam, and here is someone who repeatedly, you know, rejects full surrender, because on the other hand, how many people fully surrender? Very few. So, you know, it's just a, it's just a question of, where my level of conditioning, where I level off at. Because almost everyone levels off on some uh, degree of conditioning and surrender. And we shouldn't think, just because I'm more surrendered to that person, therefore I'm in a better position. Because I'm probably also leveled off somewhere. You know, it may not be a demigod, but it may be at something else, some other position on the ladder where I, have, I don't want to climb any higher give up my comfort zone. But anyway, so if there's one person who's very inquisitive and wants to learn, and I, and I only have time to serve, I only have X amount of time, well, better I give more attention to those persons who are, as Prabhupada said, you, know, you, you oil the wheel, it squeaks the most. So whoever is actually desirous of being more Krishna conscious, then you... You know, try to help that person more. And then, you know, but we always try to help everyone. Because, uh, as Srila Prabhupada said, uh, we were discussing this yesterday, that uh, when someone learns how to play the piano wrong, and then you try to teach them how to play, it's very difficult for them to learn properly. So when someone learns you know, who is Krishna in the wrong way, it's more difficult for them to accept Krishna in the right way than someone who has no conception of Krishna. So if someone comes to Krishna consciousness cold, with no understanding of Krishna, demigods, anything else, then they'll accept 
the, the concept of Krishna easier. And someone may be very pious and everything, but they have the very strongly rooted in their consciousness the idea of worshiping different, then you know, it's going to take some time. It may take a whole lifetime. Maybe they just can't give that up, but they can accept Krishna. So as long as they're accepting Krishna to some degree, then we should make every effort to give them Krishna consciousness. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ki, Shri Radha Kalachanji ki, Ananta Koti Vaishnavindi ki, Jai.